there we are. Hello. What is it? every single time I've used Zoom a maximum of three times now? It's always the same issue with the microphone. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> is I think that like is that like a known thing? I it's a kink. I think they have to figure yeah. out. It got a little big really fast. So. Oh, is that yeah? Because I hadn't really heard about Zoom until. We all went into lockdown, you know. So it seems exactly. Yeah, exactly. It was like, here's your lockdown, and now here is Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 This is this is what we've been working on. We knew this was going to happen. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it feels like, doesn't it? Oh man, we should have all back in January just bought stock in it. Had we known. Oh man. Oh yeah. I told I told my folks. When was it? It must have been twenty years ago when the first iPod came out. 20 years ago was it around 2004 something like that yeah before yeah i said to my parents invest in apple stock now oh yeah we'll do it we'll do it they didn't do it and oh no i was seven the iphone came out or whatever it was and yeah. look how big that was being so <laughs> i always want i always wind them up about it you know like yeah. you, could have, you could have been rich and i could have been rich based on that <laughs> <laughs> Could have, should have, yeah. would have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's too many of those, isn't there? <laughs> Who would have thought 2020 is the one that we never saw coming? I know. A, a lot of people A lot of people just want to just get past it now and get past the whole year, you know. Absolutely. Because uh, we don't know how the world's going to be on the other side of this now as well. No, not Absolutely. at all. With kind so. of anything to do with trade, any, anything really. Because look, uh, yeah. look at the airline industry. My brother works for Airbus. And oh. they're because you know Boeing, Airbus, they make all the big planes worldwide. Yeah. So it's all it's all gone a bit crazy. He's working in Germany now, so yeah, it's a bit crazy. Yeah, there's actually a Boeing plant. Uh, we used to work on suits together. Um, oh yeah, I saw the photograph the of the basketballs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the next building over was actually Boeing's research facility in Toronto. Oh so, wow! Okay. Yeah. It's, Really how, uh, how are you guys? Do you want to introduce you, yourselves? Who, uh, you, your names and the and your beautiful dog's name. Um, hi, I'm Courtney Galen. I'm, I'm... Michael T. Burgess. <laughs> ah, let's go again. <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna that's gonna stay in though. Okay, fantastic. We're a married couple, clearly. So, yeah. uh, and our son Gus. Yeah, Gus Augustus is the star. Reginald yeah, it, it the timing that's of. The time of your film was absolutely perfect for me personally because <laughs> my, my partner and I, we um, were looking to get a dog soon and uh, we've just bought this house. We've been doing it up for a year or so. This room has exposed concrete floors, no door, no carpet, oh. nothing. It's not a feature. It's just because it's not finished. <laughs> well, it's so, time for the dog. Do it now. Exactly, yeah. So... Uh, <laughs> And we we just watched the first Lady and the Tramp. It was the first thing we watched on Disney Plus when it came out, uh, because Dis uh, Disney Plus hasn't been out here very long. It's only been a few weeks, yeah. and we watched that. Oh, that's great! And then we started the festival, and then uh, and then your film came along. Like that is like meant to be. So you watched the live action one. Uh, we watched, sadly, I watched the live action Aladdin last night. That's, that's a different oh story. My God. Uh, but yeah, we watched the live action one as well. It really doesn't have the same charm. Um, it doesn't. I honestly, the live action one, I cried the whole time. <laughs> I cried the whole movie. <laughs> the cartoon one, it was sweet and adorable. And I don't know, maybe it's because I yeah. only have a fur dog. Right. <laughs> yeah. That'll be it. Yeah. It's uh, I think a lot of the whimsy and the playfulness lost on the live action things you see. Yeah. But, but you know the new the uh, remake had F. Murray Abraham and I love him so he's uh, you know some good <laughs> yeah. actors in that. So it's uh, lovely to meet you and have you on the podcast. Well, thanks for having us. This is this is on the early stages of what we're doing. I just thought it'd be nice to kind of bring people on board that have um, I was going to say subjected uh, su um, submitted their films to us. Uh, and yeah, everyone seems to be really kind of happy about doing that, which is really nice. And then it gets to, you know, cause the whole point initially was, uh, give people a creative outlet and kind of you've, you've run with it with your film and uh, who, um, who shot your film? <laughs> um, yeah, make sure the two of you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we did. We, um, luckily like we're filmmakers and we teach uh filming TV course at a college. Oh, cool. So yeah. To have like 
our, our equipment. So we had a tripod and we had ah, right, a couple right. of like lights, thank God, or we yeah. would have been like leaning it up on bookshelves and hoping for the best. But a lot of it, um, anything with Gus was really easy because we didn't have to be in the shot with him. We could just hold yeah. the camera and go. Exactly, um, yeah. Shooting it on a phone made it really easy because yeah. you weren't worrying about focus pulling and sizing with your lenses. It was just kind of like, <laughs> we're going to get what we can get and then we'll fix yeah. it in post to fix the frame in post. There's a lot yeah, of that exactly. happening. And, and although we yeah. do have a lot of like the Filmic Pro app and stuff like that, it, that would be more cumbersome just shooting it with the regular app, uh, the phone app with, on the iPhone. We yeah, found I, just shooting in 4K gave us a lot more room to be flexible in post. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in post, we threw a grain on it to make it not look like it was shot on a phone. And it kind of looked like it was, I, I noticed that's grain earlier. It was like, but it wasn't a bad thing. It felt like more of a home video. Okay. Yeah. Kind of yeah. We tried to make it, it look, you know, not. <laughs> yeah, you try and try and pull it apart a bit. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I re I recommended Filmic Pro to uh, a friend of mine, and uh, she's uh, for her submission. She um she put together uh, diary entries of how she's getting on, and she just moved from Boston to North Carolina. And whenever you drive That's anywhere awesome. anywhere in the Canada or the US, it's like, oh yeah, I just drove there. Our drive is like what four hours max. <laughs> <laughs> from north to south of the country yours is what it can be a couple of days if not more to get um, out of ontario itself um takes almost a day if not a day and a half yeah wow that's incredible <laughs> yeah it's a lot so, of that's a big yeah. country <laughs> did you um did you edit your film on your phone or is it on a computer or uh we used filmic pro right no no no, no we just use regular apple but we Edited on Final Cut. Pro. Oh yes, Final yeah. Cut Pro. We edited on that. Oh, but cool. uh, yeah, nothing, nothing fancy. And as far as the, the story behind it is that Court was actually writing uh, a web series treatment um, that had to do with the dog. And then when we found out there was an isolation film festival call in Canada, and Court's like, we could do basically a pitch, <laughs> three minute pitch with this, and let's see where it goes yeah so and now that digital series is now uh morphed to kind of include the COVID-19 pandemic so where it started as this couple experiencing a tragic loss and then finding love with a dog again um we've now incorporated the pandemic so now when we actually do go to shoot it um when we're allowed to we can incorporate things like the social distancing and not being able to touch each other and how we're going to communicate with family instead of family coming over for, you know, yeah. um, consoling the couple. Now we have to do it. There's that extra layer of separation, which I think makes it that much more current and interesting. I, I'd agree yeah. with you there because we've got um, a neighbor across the road. We're really friendly with It's quite a nice street. It's on an old army base here. And, mm -hmm. um, the dog is one of the most playful, loving creatures across the way. And they hold on to the lead of the dog now. And they never, they've never done that in years. Yeah. So it's like the fact that you're holding your dog back from family members that are dropping things off. The dog doesn't yeah. know what's going on. You know, that kind of that real separation for an animal that doesn't truly understand what's going on is it must be quite an incredible thing, you know. This past, yeah, this past weekend, we were um, able to go for a walk and there wasn't many people out near Niagara Falls. And Gus saw another dog across the path and he just wanted to go over, sniff, and it's just like you see both of us and we're not even thinking, just holding back the rain <laughs> yeah. so much. Yeah. It's, and it's, whenever we take him shopping with us and whatnot, um, and we do volunteer work with him, so... In the past. he's Yeah, we did <laughs> yeah. until now. Um, but whenever we did, he's such a friendly face. Kids are gravitate, like they gravitate to him. And he's so used to like sitting down and letting people and children pet him and interact with him. And now that that's not happening at all, it's kind of, it's eerie and sad. I don't know what he's thinking about it. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what um what kind of volunteer work have you done before? Um, my mom worked at a youth correctional facility, 
So um, they would have like a dog therapy program where we could go in and they would, there'd be four or five people who would sign up for the program and they'd just, you know, get to hang out with them and play outside. Um, we were starting to get into volunteering in uh, like nursing homes and we were hoping to go to a children's hospital. Again, that's kind of off the table, off the table at the moment. I'm not sure yeah. how long it's going to be. But in the end, that's kind of the end goal. We would love to do that kind of work with him because he's such a great, you know, energy to have around. Yeah, the amount of joy that brings people. Because uh, I work at a university in Chester, and um, that's in the northwest, near kind of Liverpool, Manchester way. And yeah. when we we've we've had members of staff that have brought their dog in for that very similar uh, reasoning uh, reasons, and um, the effect it has is incredible. Like I, I, I was there because I was taking photographs to kind of highlight it in a kind of publication. Mm -hmm. And when I see any kind of dog, I'm like, ah, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like when I saw your film, I showed it to my partner, Vicky. It was obviously because the time differences, I can't remember what time it came in. I was in bed. I was almost in tears. I'm right, Vicky, you got to watch this now. Because, uh, <laughs> because my, right, the way I feel it during isolation is how I hate plane flight because plane flight's not that common here because we don't do many interior flights it's all europe or the other side of the pond so to speak so when i'm on a, on a plane i feel drained and my emotions are all over the place and <laughs> so i f i feel that kind of that way i'm getting a bit a bit stir crazy at the moment oh yeah uh, things are okay I'm, I'm very lucky to have a job whilst i'm w in this situation so i'm very lucky there when we saw your film, when I, I, I stopped it, I said, Vicky, you've got you to wake up. You've got to wake up, man. You've got to watch this. Honestly, I, I never do that. I would never do that to anyone normally. <laughs> when we watched the film, it was, it was just your, your choice of movement with your camera as well. Everything had a lot of purpose. You could see your, both your experiences in uh, TV and film based on like some of the, like, the push-in on Gus as well and when he was lying down little choices like the very important one when like when you see kids in a film and if it's from their perspective it's their height the camera's looking up I think that was a very good a very good uh, uh, choice you made with that and yeah we absolutely loved it and we have <laughs> only myself Vicky and a couple of other people at work and Chris the other founder of the festival have watched it so uh, I can't wait for other people to see it, you know. I don't Me agree. too. If like, we showed it just to family, and we've gotten some really great feedback. They're like, just put it on YouTube and let it go viral. And I'm like, well, oh, that's, no. that's what happens. But <laughs> I, think it, I think it would prove extremely popular. <laughs> I would well, absolutely we'll say so, yeah. Um, that face is, what can you do, right? Exactly, yeah. So kind of what... Um, so I know you directed, uh, Courtney, you directed something called Hunter's Choice recently. Was it last year? Um, we shot Hunter's Chance in 2018. Oh, 2018. Um, in April, like hilariously so, there was a giant ice storm and it was like, I prayed to the gods and it was amazing. Um, so we <laughs> shot that in April and then it did its festival run um, last, last year. year, back when we could still go to festival, festivals and whatnot. And um, then in between that, I've shot two, three, three other short films that mm -hmm. now, because we're in isolation, um, I'm we're able to done. work with my editors and we're able to focus and get everything done. So we're yeah. just starting to pick and choose what festivals we want to submit to, um, just simply because we don't really know what that's going to look like, what a, a festival run is going to look like. And the whole point of making short films is to share them with people and get eyes on them. Um, and if the festivals aren't really running, we're kind of not doing that. So we're looking at some online festivals um, and maybe submitting it to something like iShorts TV that just lets people see the work. Um, so that's kind of what we're using this downtime to do. And <laughs> what are you, um, uh, what are you kind of missing at the moment? What's the standout thing? I know going outside is like everyone's going to go to, but. I'm missing the coffee shops. Yeah. yeah little small yeah. things. Yeah. The little things. Yeah. Yeah. We have one coffee shop that we go to in Toronto all the time called um, the rooster. And it's just, it's like a hub 
for artists like you people are always working people there's always people writing there's always actors talking about the projects that they're working on yeah. um there's always people there's just a buzz of creativity in that space and we're there at least every day yeah. <laughs> if we're if, not on set. if you've seen the daniel radcliffe movie uh the f word or what if it's yeah, the yeah, one yeah. The, yeah it's the one that they yeah. go to in that Oh wow! So very popular then. It must look yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, the best music in that area. So yeah, but, superb. Yeah, I totally miss that. And just little things like we're used to seeing family. Like uh, I yeah. still have three grandparents that are alive, and you have like a little niece that we just haven't been able to see. We knew a lot more FaceTime, which is something yeah. that we definitely wanted to put in our film because that's- Oh, that was, that was really great. That scene specifically, everything's, we, we really enjoyed it across the board, but that scene with the family, the way it was cut together, I thought that was really quite effective. Awesome. Um, and yeah, because, it, because of that kind of therapy thing you do with your dog anyway, it, family members miss must miss your dog so so much oh yeah oh, like my grandparents i don't know if they just refused to learn how to facetime or just didn't want to know how to facetime until recently like last month yeah. we finally got them to do it and the, the first thing they ask whenever we connect is where's gus <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like hey how yeah. are you it's just, where's yeah, the dog yeah, yeah. it's like i don't yeah, i don't care about you too. i want to just see the exactly. dog the, where's the great grandchild you know <laughs> so i mean it's great so you were saying you submit on was it on suits we <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh we met online yeah on plenty oh, of fantastic things. yeah that's uh, where my, myself my partner met as well <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 the funny part was on our second date i go to pick her up and there's a costume supervisor that i've known for about a decade She's like, what are you doing here? Like, uh, this is the address I got to pick Courtney up. Slams the door in my face. And what'd she scream up there? She's like, she yelled up the stairs because I was getting ready. Hey, Courtney, remember what I said about film and TV people? Not this one. And then she opens the door and she's like, come on in, Mike. <laughs> and she's amazing. Up the coffee. It, 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 <laughs> we've kind of run in the same circles and kept missing each other yeah so also you've never met before no no um and then yeah we we worked together on suits um mike actually helped me get my first day job type thing working in background casting um then we started working together that way and then we're starting our company and then we got married so what, what was your uh, kind of collective experience of working on something like suits um a mixed bag. I don't speak ill of anyone who used to live in the country you used to and now lives in the country. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a fair a great, point, yeah. Yes. So. You know what? It was a great it experience. Was, the cast is lovely, but even more important, the crew was lovelier. You yeah. worked on it since, since the first season. Se since season one. And I worked wow. I on the third season, and it went for eight? Nine. Not, no, nine. no. Not, is it nine seasons? Wow. Nine seasons. It was nine. Eight. It was nine. Okay, whatever. Anyway, it, so it started to feel like <laughs> yeah. family, regardless. Like that show, it was a show that we both worked on for a really long time with a lot of the same people. And it was a really great experience. Yeah. Like gossip and rumors aside, it was, it was a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah. Well, we've, we've got some interesting feelings this side of the pond on the. Uh, on <laughs> so. Yeah. Anyway. We can do a whole other episode about that. Yeah. Um, well. So yeah, that's that's really quite interesting. Uh, I, I've obviously I've just had a little look at your IMDb, Courtney, because some of the <laughs> some of the titles are very interesting, and one that kind of caught my eye was Halloween okay. Jesus. Oh God, that uh, please, okay. Please tell, please tell me what the premise yeah, is. And what, tell me about that. So that one, I don't know why. It's such a good title. <laughs> I've tried so hard to get rid of that fucking credit. Oh right. <laughs> um. Anyway, so <laughs> do, you, do you want me to cut this out? <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. When I when I started off um, doing some acting work, I did a bunch of student films just because I wanted to get some footage for my demo reel. Unfortunately, this Halloween Jesus never made it to my reel. Um, but it was a student film that they allowed union actors to work on. So I said, okay. 
And I played the role of Mary, so Jesus' mother. And my Jesus was literally two years younger than I was. It was like so bad. They gave me some aging makeup, but it was just, anyway. So it was Halloween night and I was picking him up from, oh Christ, what was this? this Literally. He had gone to jail. (laughs) He had gone to jail and I was picking my son up and it was metaphorical that he was dressed up as Jesus because I wasn't actually like Mary, the mother, and he wasn't actually Jesus, Jesus. He was, anyway, so I picked him up at this. I forgot that uh, all. Right? <laughs> I picked him up at the jail. He was telling me like the hardships that he's had and the hardships of life and the weight of society on his shoulders. And I just held his hand and he just cried. He just emoted. And I, it was the worst, craziest thing I've ever done. <laughs> and I don't know why it's hard <laughs> it, was yeah. like, it was like a scene study type thing. And yeah i yeah need to you need to grab some stills for that and stick them up there i i don't know if there were even any taken i think it was like a a i totally forgot about this two minute (laughs) film yeah episode memory (laughs) lane so uh, i have a very very small uh spot of experience on feature films i worked on something and uh it was a, a gerald butler thing years ago and uh, I can, to, to my experience, it was only for like six months, but I can certainly t- attest to the circles people kind of share when you come to crew or behind the scenes. It's kind of a, it's quite a big community, isn't it? It's a big, small community. Yeah. That's the best way I can yeah, describe it. It's huge, but then it's like niche as well. Yeah. yeah. And you, I find, especially in television, even in, in feature films, um, the same teams tend to like bop to different productions when one kind of wraps that team as a whole kind of goes on to something else. Um, like our good friends who were the first and second assistant directors on Suits for the last season on the odd episodes, um, they went right over to The Expanse for the uh, oh, season. Oh, wow. Great. So, but it's in the same town, just on the other side of the city. So. Yeah. There's a lot being made in uh, that, that part of the world, isn't there? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The studios are, were jam-packed. Yeah. And it, it, this, um, the industry was just starting to really pick up, looking at the hot lists of what was supposed to start shooting. April was supposed to be a really huge um, Lots month. of features, lots and, of series uh, coming back. Yeah. What? So now we just kind of... Wait. wait and see um that that's going to kind of bottleneck in a huge way with talent with production crews everything's going to be like like that and the yeah. funny part is, is that it's going to bottleneck but it's also it's going to be so different because just when you're looking at having crowd scenes anymore is that going to happen when is that going to happen it's gonna be a lot. More, there's think, gonna be a lot more post on that, isn't there? I guess it's yeah. gonna be a lot more post and a lot more bought footage, unfortunately. Yeah. But I, I yeah. honestly think that indie production and smaller production might be having like a head start, just simply because they're much smaller productions and they're much more contained, and they kind of fit the restrictions that are being talked about with the amount of people on set who's allowed to actually be on set um, with talent and who has to be separated. I think it's more conducive to an indie style um, shoot as mm-hmm. opposed Absol- to a studio Absolutely. style. Absolutely. From, from what I know of it, like much smaller crews, because you can attest to this way better than I can in terms of the size of the crews. That's going to have to be drastically cut back now. Absolutely. It's, it sucks <coughs> because, you know, it's jobs, right? And people, Absolutely, yeah. like, they're already Hurting. difficult jobs to get. Um, but Because when you, go from, when you go from indie to scale up to feature, there are, say, you can, you, like, like your film, uh, uh, the camera operator, talent, uh, maybe a lighting gaffer and a few other people. When you step up the production, you need those extra bodies. You need all of them. The moment you have special, the moment you have special effects, you're looking at at least two to seven people, yeah. depending on the size of what you're seeing. What well, on and set? 
Yeah. On yeah. The set. And in, in our productions um, so far, every production that we've done, regardless of the, like the size of the project, everyone wears multiple hats and I'm directing and producing and doing craft and like getting snacks for people. And my uh, DOP is also camera op because he likes to camera op where in the union world on a big project that wouldn't happen. Like there are specific um, jobs for specific people in, and in the team you don't like double dip and you don't do different things like this is your job and you stay in this lane and it's for safety and also unionize like you're not stepping on other people's toes everyone has a purpose to be on set so it's going to be tough to say which jobs are necessary because every job is ne necessary on yeah you, you speak to any other um camera operator or focus puller or anything like that anyone in those key positions or grip uh they're gonna say yeah all of these people are key because they are like yeah roger, De roger deakins can't do everything he does on his productions you can oh. see he's chomping at the bit to operate the cameras and you see him i don't know how that works with a um a bsc uh, member or working in the uh in the us but he you know he loves to operate when he can and mm -hmm. how is that yeah how before the lockdown, uh, if someone was a camera operator, but they wanted to be the focus puller and do a couple of other roles, what's in place on set um, to stop that? And how is that regulated? Um, it's really, I know with IATSE uh, 600, which is the camera union um, in North America, at least, um, it really is just a case of each job is defined in their agreement. Um, so, I believe some DPs might do the A-camera operation, but overall they're sitting back in their tent playing with the apertures through the scene. And so. on a union show, um, like you said, the categories are clearly defined and it you start at the lowest rung and you work your way up and you establish relationships with DPs and you can show, hey, I can do this on set. And then the next time they'll put you in a different category. But to mix and mingle um, freely isn't like a known thing if that's um, what you're interested in. And if that's how you want to stretch yourself as a filmmaker doing different things, the indie you. world is yeah. conducive to that because we're thriving when looking for people who can wear multiple hats and do it um, <laughs> without holding grudges and being angry about it you know yeah from uh, your experience of uh, indie filmmaking what what role is or what two or three roles do you think find the most difficult without someone that specializes in it so like a lighting technician or someone that works with the dop what kind of roles do you think oh, i can't quite do that i need to bring sound. someone else in um, <laughs> sound one thousand percent one thousand percent I mean, it's such an important piece when it comes to, you know what, every, every, I'm going to get quartered, drawn and quartered for saying this. Every aspect is very important, but I think sound is something that is really hard to fix in post. If you don't have amazing lighting um, on set, that's something that if you can find a colorist, they can play with it and manipulate it in post to kind of get Enough. it to where you want it to be. Yeah. It might not be perfect, but there's room for manipulation. Um, and that whole fix it in post saying that people need to stop saying. Um, but when it comes to sound, if it's not, if you don't have a strong mixer on set or someone who knows what they're doing and you don't have a clean product to give to the uh, sound liner and the re-recording mixer, you can't fix it. The only way to fix it is by doing ADR. And when you can't afford to have a sound mixer on set, you definitely can't afford ADR yeah. in post. So it, for me, it's sound 100%. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that other directors might say a DOP and pitcher, but... Also, the other one I would say is finding someone who is great with picture cars and transport because that's one that I have my regular G-class license. When it comes to moving anything larger than a caravan, I need the help. Also yeah. sourcing vehicles that are not modern um, or even sometimes modern 
that's a talent unto itself that usually goes unrecognized. So yeah. um, we were prepping for a shoot that di didn't go to camera, um, but to get a bus, to get a bus with 10 people on it doesn't seem like a huge deal, yet you need someone who has those relationships, has those licenses that can actually stretch out and find exactly what you need. And also with that, you need the mechanic that comes with it because that bus can run every day for 25 years, but the day you get it on set is the day it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh... like 30 people that are so important. Like, <laughs> but yeah, and that's the thing, yeah. <laughs> It's Absolutely, yeah. Um, how just to take it back to your uh, your film Goss and Oz, um, how long did it uh, take you to shoot it? We Four. shot Four. it Four it, like in bits because again we're working with a, with a dog and <laughs> sometimes he wants to cooperate and sometimes he didn't want to cooperate. Um, he's great and he'll do anything for a treat. But it was about we shot it. I don't know, like a couple of hours over four days. Yeah. And then sometimes he'd be doing something adorable. So I just whip my phone out and catch it. And then we use it as B roll or something. Yeah. Um, I love the, uh, that, I love, when he was playing with the, uh, the door stopper. <laughs> <laughs> love that. that. The door stopper <laughs> is a thing. Um, we're at Courtney's parents' house at the moment. Um, and he finds these door stoppers. He will walk by it. And then he will look at it as if it attacked him, bark at it. <laughs> And then stop, see that it stopped moving, bark at it one more time, and then walk away. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's great. But it's not like it's not something that we have in our apartment in the city. We don't have doorstops. So it's not something that we social when we had him as a puppy, we didn't think to socialize him. So it he hates oh, it. Oh, I see, right. Like he, he, he <laughs> just can't get past it. Like he hates it. And That's amazing. we don't have like a doorbell either in Toronto. So whenever someone's at the door like at the, door and the doorbell rings or there's one on the a tv he'll go bananas and it's the mom fail i think that's amazing uh there's just one more uh credit courtney that i wanted to highlight it's not halloween jesus 2 or anything I <laughs> i'm writing that one oh, <laughs> you do it for the next competition you gotta you gotta write that i'm so sorry i can't remember who the director was that. i'm so sorry I I as soon as I see Halloween in someone's credits, I'm like, oh, that appeals to me because I love horror, you see. Um, yeah, this is a horror movie. <laughs> so uh, what was it like working on uh, Orphan Black? Um, that one was, like, it was the teeny tiniest little part. Um, so I would love to have a better story about it. Um, I was just singing uh, in, like, a... When did they went to? Quiet. Some it was a prolifian hymn singer type thing yeah i think it was a choir wasn't it or something yeah they were i don't mormon is the wrong thing to say but when they went off i didn't watch the show i suck um <laughs> anyway when they're like off in the cult i was one of the people who sang and it, it it was cool and it was awesome i didn't get to work with tat um but Catherine um oh. alexandri her acting double is actually, I know her from acting class. We were pretty good friends. Oh, amazing. Um, we were in the same class when she booked this job. So it was really cool. Um, I got to hang out with her on set. And it was, it was, everyone was kind and sweet. Everything positive that you hear about that show is, is accurate. Everyone is wonderful. Um, but I did a few days um, doing my day job as background casting on that. So I actually spent more time on Orphan Black as crew than as cast. So that was kind of a... So um, what, what, kind of, what kind of role is that exactly in uh, background casting? What do you do? Um, so my boss is the background casting director and she chooses who's to be on set. She is the one who goes to um, meetings with the production teams and the director to say, you know, here's this giant scene. For example, uh, we were working on Mrs. America. Um, how do you want these women to look? There's a difference between the pro ERA women and the anti ERA women, like, and establishing what that look was. Okay. Um, so she's in those meetings. I got to assist her actually and be part of that, which was really cool. Um, and then she gets, you know, like, tons of 
photos and headshots and things from agents and actors who want to be on these shows. And she sifts through them and chooses um, who would be right for that particular look. Um, she sends out the calls to, yep, you're working this day, this day, this day. And I'm kind of her eyes and ears on set. So when there's a bigger background day, plus 21 people usually, um, I get to go to set and I make sure that everyone shows up who's supposed to show up, that they look the way that they're supposed to look, that everyone's being respectful of each other. Um, yeah, I'm kind of an advocate absolutely. for the background. If um, someone, say on the hair and makeup team or the wardrobe department, if they're being really rude or they have an issue with background people, I'm kind of that middle ground. Oh, of, I see. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, let's all play in the sandbox and get along with each other kind of that referee do you have to um, to kind of turn people away that are like uh not fit for work so to speak very rarely seldom like very <laughs> rarely but yeah there's been a couple of times um where it's just an unfortunate they come to set um maybe having a really difficult time yeah, and they yeah. haven't brought proper wardrobe or they haven't maintained the look that stays in their their headshot and they show up looking completely different um a, like a big example is when we have police officers i think every show that i've ever worked on they want production wants clean shaven cops so absolutely that makes a lot of stuff. sense yeah unless it's yeah. a character trait and it's like you know the first couple of tiers of actors that are in it and there's for some reason for it there's no reason for them not to be yeah so if someone shows up with a, a, like a beard or stubble the first thing that we ask is do you mind shaving your facial hair yeah, i couldn't and, be a cop then i couldn't be a cop and then some people will be like yeah no and i'll say well why did you take this job because it's not a surprise like my boss says flat out if you want to be a police officer you have to clean shaven short Absolutely, hair. Yeah. So I say, why did you take this job? And I'll go, well, I thought they wouldn't mind. And then we politely ask them to leave. Um, or it's, sometimes people will yeah. come and they'll be like, yeah, that's fine. I'll, I can shave. And then I, again, referee, I deal with those situations. That's really quite a uh, fascinating role to have because you're, you're trying to be super nice and pleasant and make sure everything's kind of, there's so many cogs in all of these things you both can attest to. And, that's, I'd say that's, that's a very important one as well, just making sure everyone's right in the background, you know. Uh, it, it, it can make or break a project, really. Like, you, people often forget about the background because it's usually so seamless when it's done. Um, and when it's done well, you're not supposed to be distracted by the background. But if you take it away, um, it's very, very obvious that something's missing because that's, it's kind of the heartbeat around the actors. Well, look at Murdoch Mysteries. That's, yeah, that's one. Without the background, Murdoch would just be standing by himself ninety percent of the time. Yeah. <laughs> when you like, so. I've got you know, I I do a, a little bit of uh, making short films here and there, and I do a lot of kind of corporate stuff and that kind of thing. You really, it's it's like the lifeblood of the scene, really, isn't it? Because you've got the beating heart, which is in front of you, the the kind of main cast, and then some of the actors, some of the the people, the way they're interacting with pages. I kind of look out for certain things like that in. Just for just for reference to other stuff, and uh, it is so so important, especially for production value. A, fr a friend of mine, Chris Berry, who co-founded this festival of, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, it was a couple of months ago or something like that. Um, he was in uh, Florence Foster Jenkins, you know, with uh, Hugh Grant. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he's not. But he is <laughs> because there's, there's production photos, and because it's very high profile, because you've got uh, you know some some of the biggest A-list actors going. And yeah. <laughs> he has seen the scene and I've seen photos before and after he's taken out of it. But he's not... <laughs> it's not It's not a different... You've seen, probably seen this in your shows as well. It's not uh, a different take. They just took some of the actors out in the back. Yeah. <laughs> he's, cross, he's, got, he's so proud and he's in his, he's in his uh, uh, full, full costume because he's about 100 feet away from, um, oh God, what's it? Mel Streep's character. And he's walking past the back of her, across the road. I think some of it was shot in Liverpool and because of the buildings. And 
<laughs> he was devastated because they used CG to remove him. <laughs> 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 oh, so he's no. not in it. He's not like an uncredited role where you can see him in the distance or something. It's uh, he just taken out. Wow. <laughs> oh, oh. Some... too handsome. Yeah. Let's just say he was just <laughs> too, too handsome. We had to. Yeah, he'll love that. He'll love that. Yeah. Yeah, just too too handsome. My well, favorite that... is when background performers try to take pictures of like a list stars on set <laughs> that's, that's like straight and fire then, you just get time to and go then yeah it? and oh, then yeah. they get they get caught i mean we my, had a couple of those yeah on this is america my, my favorite to this day is when an actor a background performer tries to steal the scene from an a-list <laughs> actor <laughs> Sometimes it's good though. Sometimes it's good, and then sometimes it throws the entire movie. I saw Donnie Brasco, and in the scene where Al Pacino is being arrested, there is one FBI agent in a windbreaker. I've never seen it before. He holds his gun up like this <laughs> as he's running, and as they're pulling Johnny Depp away, I'm like, the movie's done for me now. This guy pulled yeah. me right out. Going, what the heck? I'll, I'll tell thing? you. Th I'll tell you two that I've seen in two <laughs> massive movies. One's Enter the Dragon and one's North by Northwest. And in, <laughs> and in Enter the Dragon, you know the huge scenes where Bruce Lee and um, what's he called? Uh, Jim something. The Oh my God, the other fighter. Anyway, there's a oh, scene yeah. with... Uh, oh, what's he called? Black Belt Jones, the actor in Black Belt Jones. I can't remember. Uh, I'll, anyway. put, I'll put a picture up like I've done before in the last interview. I couldn't remember someone's name. <laughs> and... Um, uh, yeah, the, they're having a huge fight and there's everyone's in white, Bruce Lee's in his black pants and Lee does one of these kicks uh, like a fantastic moves and everyone's looking deadpan serious but there's one chap in the scene that he's just brightly smiling, laughing, laughing, laughing everyone's serious, you never see this guy again and it's like, <laughs> what the hell is going on? And the other one in North by Northwest and at, one of my personal favourites because I'm a huge Hitchcock fan uh, there's a. Have you seen it? Yeah. Yes. You know the scene in the uh, kind of like community cafe area in um, uh, South Dakota where the uh, the monument is. Yeah. Well, there's. It's kind of a continuity thing, but it's like it th it'll throw you when you watch it now. It's <laughs> when you know when they do that fake gunshot to mm -hmm. suggest the two characters, E. Marie Satan and uh, Cary Grant, have kind of broken up. Well, just before he shoots, a little boy puts his fingers in his ears. Say, so, because he, yeah, everyone knows it's coming. Apart from this lad knows it's coming, but he just ruins it. <laughs> so when you see it again, it's not like he's trying to do yeah. something fancy, but it's like, oh my god, I can't unsee that no now. Awesome. That's awesome. Like, uh, there's the last, so many. There's yeah. so many, but there's, you know how you you probably know this. You know how a lot of shows in kind of the late 90s shot 16 by 9, but they actually cropped for 4.3 yep. TVs. So they released uh, The X-Files, one of my personal favourites. Uh, they released that in 16 by 9 in HD, and it looks glorious because it's so well lit. It's shot on film. It's beautiful. But when you look at something like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, they talk to the production crew about, oh, can we, can we release a 16 by 9 because people will love it. People will buy it again, buy it again. But there's like lighting gaffers holding things. <laughs> So it's not just they've cropped for four three. They've gone like that. It was like people are like this. <laughs> That's so good. That's yeah. So good. They should release a version with all of that in because it's just like yeah. lighting stands and everything. You know. Yeah. Got the one boom guy there. For, for sure, just yeah. like doesn't care. Um, have you seen that yeah. Kevin? Have you seen that Kevin James thing? He's started his YouTube channel. Yes. Yeah. The kind of audio recording guy. Yeah. I saw the one with Will Smith and he's screaming. Oh man. <laughs> Yeah. Look at it's how creative you can be. In it's quite outfit. interesting that it, it kind of didn't coincide. It started before lockdown that he's, he doesn't need to do it, but he's kind of gone to like an online platform now and he's creating this really, it looks like expensive content, you know, with what he's oh, doing, yeah. especially yeah. the lighting because the lighting matches perfectly with the, uh, I think it was the Star is Born one, but he's on stage saying, yeah, go on. Yes. <laughs> But it matches perfectly, and you know how difficult that is to achieve when, to match the lighting perfectly. Absolutely. Not being in a studio? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, what were you both working on before uh, 
this kind of lockdown? Um, we were both working in different jobs on Guillermo del Toro's uh, new feature um, called Nightmare Alley. Oh, and, wow. Uh, it, got, it got shut down. Um, Unfortunately. So, yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, that sucked. And I had just, I had just gotten a grant for another short film that I had written and I'm going to direct. We were hoping to do it this fall, but um, we'll see. We'll see. So I'm still prepping that as if we're going to go to shoot in the fall and finding our cast and whatnot. Um, so do you think a lot of, do you think a lot of TV and film like uh, Nightmare Alley? Cause everyone's looking for the next, cause Courtney, you went with the stuntman from Shape of Water. Is that right on? Yeah, yeah. Steve Lichkescu yeah. and on almost well, all of all our, our staff, projects. Yeah. Steve's a good friend. <laughs> He's become a friend. Yeah. Like I, uh, we, I don't know. I of course was up my butt for that one because he's huge and I, yeah. he's the sweetest person. In the world. Yeah. Um, so I was just thinking, I just thought, um, you know, that in Die Hard 2 where all the planes are circling the airport because they, <laughs> yeah. because they can't land, but then obviously one's forced to. Uh, we're not quite in the situation where one's forced to, like a film's forced to start up again. Do you think a lot of these productions are, that are currently being in uh, hiatus, are they going to come back like Nightmare Alley, do you think? Good question. Um, I've been talking with some of the people who are higher up at that show, and they're really not sure how they're going to come back because stuff that hasn't been shot yet um, I know there's at least one day that they were talking about having a large crowd. So it's like. We're really, it's one scene because that it's a big background day. And I remember I was told that we were going to be put up in hotels. So that one giant scene was probably going to be a couple of weeks worth of work. And obviously you can't do that. Yeah. Um, I think the productions, this is going to be horrible to say that have the money will be able to come back first simply because um they kind of like they push, afford, push that ahead yeah they can afford to make the pro the provisions that they have to in order to get their stuff done i think projects that are half finished will probably get precedence before any um let's well, we're past kind of pilot season but there were three or four pilots that we were supposed to be working on they're just done i just think like unfortunately i have a feeling that they're just not going to happen yeah. which is like so heartbreaking for any actor or director or writer and this is their first you know big thing like it's so heartbreaking and i hope that they come back around and pick it up maybe again but i don't this time, think this time next year basically yeah i think series that may have like series order i guess yeah. that are have time slots on tv and they're just waiting to have the content to put there i think they'll probably get um I guess like, the I guess the yeah. most difficult thing is the if we all knew it doesn't matter what job you are in the world you're all affected by the return date if we knew the return date you could plan for that like in the UK I support Liverpool football team with two ways a win from winning the league for the first time in 30 years <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I've never seen it so what they what some of the clubs have talked about is once they know their date is hiring an entire hotel just for the team making sure that's prepped and cleaned and you know because like you say can't have uh, huge crowds or whatever so they're hiring hot entire hotels for the teams around the country so they can actually go to a city stay there if you have to and then go to the pitch and then obviously there's no fans in the stadium so you can just imagine the scale of something similar on in any industry yeah. that's kind of a yeah. <clears throat> and i mean that type of scenario that they're talking about that with um, going back to uh, filming, are they going to put entire crews up into hotels? Sure. If you have the money to be able to afford that, but exactly. then if you're working with unions, you're getting paid, like you're paying a sixth day. So and, maybe you're and seven. Yeah. So maybe you're working five, but you're actually paying for seven because you're keeping these people isolated for all this time and it's i uh, it's going to be so expensive and a logistical nightmare i think yeah where i think start. of of anything like i know in australia neighbors is uh, coming back with strip 
As <laughs> Neighbours has got a unique, unique kind of relationship with the UK because obviously Britain, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> but it's one of those ones of, I honestly think of all the filming projects that are out there um, and on air, I think the soap operas are probably the best situated because when you look at them, they don't need much in the way of background. Half of them are on some sort of lazy Susan or trolley for their sets. So oh, once yeah, they just lit, spin them around, lit. yeah. Yeah, you just spray it. And <laughs> you basically make your storyline so you don't have as much interaction with all the actors. The same four actors keep showing up and having that same problem for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe, I don't know, even sitcoms, just taking out the studio audience. Um, yeah, because what's you've just you've both raised a really interesting point, or kind of highlighted one, is that even lensing to a certain degree, because if you've got someone like Roger Deakins who's using twenty-seven or thirty-five mil lens, and he wants to put an actor here, because he doesn't really, it might suit him more than other DPs, because he doesn't shoot over the shoulder as much as it's usually just a square-on shot of an in individual. So the whole technique is going to change. It's. Mm -hmm. yeah. We kind of obviously we want a lot of that to kind of revert back to how it was because filming techniques. Maybe maybe you'll see uh, innovation from this as well. And you know, I think there will be some more innovation. Um, even looking at a show like The Mandalorian that was using virtual sets for a good percentage of what they were shooting. Um, that's quite a new technique, crazy. isn't it? It's a crazy new technique. Um, and for the shows that have the money, I think they'll be able to do that. And for the shows that don't have the money doing that traditional thing of shooting off each person, I think it'll be harder, honestly, for actors. Yeah. But I think, so. you know, actors will adapt. It's a new, it's a new challenge. I don't think actors, oh, everyone likes it the way it was because they're used to it and it feels safe. But I think throwing a challenge like virtual set or different things to actors is only going to make it more exciting. I think Absolutely. I would hope. I would hope actors would be more excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. You've shed some uh, interesting light, especially with uh, what you both work on. So I really do appreciate that. And appreciate you uh, sh showing the world Gus as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for having us. This is great. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. It's, it's nice. Feel to like chat. I, always, I always feel really nervous before I speak to someone new because <laughs> I'm so confident when it comes to doing photography or uh, video work. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Or, making them at ease. But when I'm like, the camera's there, it's like, oh my God, what do I say? <laughs> and, then, and, then there's, and then the sound doesn't work. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's fine. It's, it's a Zoom enough. thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. going to blame it on Zoom, yeah. That's my next little review on my uh, Instagram is going to be blame it on Zoom. <laughs> is there on. just one little last question now? What are you kind of, what are you guys watching at the moment? Uh, I just finished watching Capture. Uh, Amazon Prime, um, fantastic spy police thing. Yeah, it was great. Uh, and there's a Big Bang marathon on for the next. My parents love the Big next, Bang. The next century. Yeah. No, like <laughs> legit. Though. Like my parents love Big Bang, and it's on. Like they wake up and it's on, and it plays all day. And yeah. we're guests in the house. I'm not gonna come on and like change. The oh, channel, I know. If that was my thing. Bang. That was my thing when uh, when Vicky and I lived with my parents and and like I moved back there after uni for a couple of, for a year or so and then I moved out and then we moved back because the house was being worked on and we couldn't live here. It was the worst because I couldn't choose what I wanted to watch. <laughs> and now and now because Vicky's daddy who had a um, he had a heart attack a, a couple of months ago, he basically had the heart attack the week before lockdown. Wow. So we, we picked him up from a hospital in Liverpool because it's a specialist hospital in Liverpool. We took him back to his flat and then the quarantine started. So like, you can't really, cause we're such a, you know, cause we, our families are quite close and we're so, you know, lots of hugs and that kind of thing. And, uh, it, it, and it is, it was such a, um, a strange thing to happen when you can't hug someone, you know? Mm -hmm. And anyway, back, back to what, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's weird because we, we visit my grandparents at least twice a month and um, two of them are, are in poor health because they're older and have been through life. 
Um, and not being able to go and visit, I think that's the toughest part. And the, we know we're not supposed to because we want to keep them healthy, but also they're already sick and so, so it's, it's that like, do we go and just say, fuck it because they have very little time and we'd rather spend the time with them yeah. or do we, you know, think long-term and it, that's, I think the toughest part yeah, for me absolutely. at least and trying to figure out like what is the right decision. Obviously we're quarantining. We haven't seen them for two months. Um, but that's, that's, incredi- the- that's incredibly difficult. Uh, so Vicky's, I think it was one of Vicky's relatives. Uh, she just had a little child, lovely, cute little baby and her mother um, I, th- I can't remember what she was suffering from. She couldn't go and see her. She wasn't allowed anywhere near the hospital and she passed away. Mm-hmm. So it's, you hear these stories that people are in those situations in. It's, you know, uh, I try and keep away from my parents, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, poor Mike, we're well, stuck in lines. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, that was a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's important to kind of yeah. highlight uh, what the situations people are in. Yeah. And, um, so uh, something, I, I'm doing this little daily thing. This isn't a plug, so I'll probably cut this out. But I'm doing this little thing on it, my Instagram account now where because I work at my desk doing technical support instead of photography, obviously, and video work, uh, I do little lunchtime things. And because I just have something quick and come back to a desk that, right, what can I do creative at my desk for an hour that's shot, edited, color, uh, do the color work, everything within, and it has to be online within an hour. So I start doing this trailer review thing. I'm not a YouTuber in any way, um, but I saw a trailer and I did my first ever reaction video and it's for a trailer for a French series called Into the Dark. Okay. Now, Into the Dark, uh, with the trailer on Netflix, it's an original Netflix show. It's not something they bought in and rebranded as Netflix. Uh, and it's about, uh, I'll tell you what's in the trailer, then you should definitely check it out. Uh, this chap kind of boards a plane with a gun in the airport uh, in somewhere in France, and he forces the plane to take off. He says, you've got to go, you've got to go west. No matter what, you've got to leave right now. And the whole premise is if you, people are dying worldwide by the sunlight, and you've got to stay in the dark. And so they forced the plane to take off and go further west because of where uh, where the light is. So they have to go to Scotland, and I don't know how it's going to continue. But the kind of crew have to work together. The people on board have to work together. It's a really interesting premise, and it's uh, yes, yeah, definitely check it out. And I saw it today for the first time. And I thought this looks great, and it's one of those ideas that we've all seen. You know, almost any idea has been exhausted. But when it's a new take on something. Yeah, quite interesting. So it had that kind of lost vibe, uh, and it's nothing is safe. We can't hear anything. We can't see anything. Yeah. Lights bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ah! Yeah, but I, I love that. <laughs> that's terrifying, but like so exciting. I just yeah. like what next. <laughs> see that that's that's what hooks me about horror is like little little uh, law creations. Like there's a film called Lights Out. And you can only see this demon uh, when the lights are turned off. So you've got to, you've got to, you've got to stay in light. It's the other way around. Oh my god! You know, so it's like something so simple yeah. that you can create a whole genre around. Exactly, like, like the whole so vampire cool. thing. Vampires with stakes and sunlight. Werewolves with silver bullets. If you can create a one-off thing like Jason Bloom does it exceptionally well with uh, his productions for his horror films. Yeah. But if you can create that little bit of law. You can have a you know a massive hit. It doesn't take much. It's but it's just discovering that, isn't it? Is the most incredible difficult thing. You know, there's there's a feature that I interviewed for. I didn't get it, um, but the story around it was so great. It was called Slashback. It takes place in a small community up in Baffin Island in uh, a Calloway, Northwest Territory, Calloway Territory, way up north in Canada, um, and it takes place in one day. And aliens land and this group of Inuit kids fight back against aliens after everything they've seen in horror movies. Wow. And for them to do it all in one day, and the reason they do it in one day is because they shot it in the summer up there where they get 22 hours of daylight. Wow. So they really took the resources around them and go, okay, how can we make a film about this? Yeah, like it's quite an achievement. Like I watched uh, Midsummer recently, 
uh, that was, it's such a dark and grim movie. <laughs> you love that movie. Oh, the, 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 genius, the genius is, it's how do you shoot a horror in daylight? How do you do that? That's an achievement in itself because we all think light shadow, monsters, that kind of thing. Yeah. But that, oh, yeah. That, have you both seen it? Yeah. He hasn't. That, I've seen parts of it. Oh, bits of it? Can, yeah. I, can I just highlight one, that, this tiny little spoiler where you see someone's face being worn? Yes. I'm like, Vicky fell asleep. She woke up and that's one of the things she saw. <laughs> I'm like, oh my, she was like, oh, what's that? <laughs> And it's that it's the I think it's Will Poulter, his face and his hair. I think you I don't. Like, I, didn't, I, I knew it was going to be creepy, and I knew it was horror, but I did not expect it to be as gruesome and as yeah. graphic as it was. There's like all of these like really kind of this is weird. Like for an hour, you're like this is kind of awkward, and then someone's face falls off. Like I, I'm still shook by it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not watching it. Really. It's like the dull, the dull sounds of those hammers and such like, you know, it's, <laughs> uh, it's quite grim. Well, I really do appreciate your time and uh, it's been really lovely to meet you and speak to you both. You too. So yeah, um, I, hope, I hope isolation treats you well and, you know, we get back to some sort of sense of normality or there's definitely green shoots in it. I think there's definitely positivity, but like there's going to be Getting through that doorway, everyone trying to do the same thing at the same time. It's going to be very tricky. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we'll find a new normal. Exactly. That's what everybody says. We'll find the new normal. Yeah. And I like how well prepared you are, Courtney, with your full outfit. And that low shot when you come in with your shopping in the film. <laughs> <laughs> that, I had just happened to go grocery shopping and we weren't going to film that day. And I'm like, you have to film this right now. I need this. And you were just like, I don't. Like, you were so over it. You're like, oh, I'm the one who went fucking grocery shopping. We're doing this now. Yeah, yeah. I got, I got that sense when it's just like the aggro level when you came through the door. Yeah, it was hilarious. Almost at the um, anger slash achievement level of doing the upside down push up and putting yeah, your shoes. Yeah, <laughs> that was real. Like, yes, I like that. <laughs> everyone. Like, trying to just like, I hope I can do it. <laughs> Everyone that's seen that, everyone's seen the film, laughed at that point going, yeah, I can see the focus. It's like every, we tried to hit every stereotypical thing that's happening right now. Yeah. yeah Tiger King in there. Like. I know. Netflix have nailed it with documentaries. I don't know how they've done it. <laughs> the Their alchemy is great. Their documentary work is sublime. Like, like some of the stuff they have, but how it's shot, who I'm if they are acquiring them or if they're originals. Yeah, they, they're post teams. They must have huge post teams because the level of uh, the level of detail and the way they put information visually across the screen, like the making a murder was the first thing that I really saw of Netflix's documentary yeah. skill set. And the way they put the information, the maps and everything. And yeah, it's uh, quite an incredible achievement what they're doing. And obviously everyone's watching their content now. <laughs> so I don't understand how their, how their plan works when it's spending billions and not, not recouping it all. It's, it's a very interesting proposition. You know? Yeah. Having, having worked with so many Netflix projects, it's kind of the, okay, we'll take your money. No problem. We have no idea how your business works whatsoever. No, no, no. Uh, but it's not like, some budgets are like they're not all billion dollar things no they're not like some of the budgets are really really small and some of the stuff that they acquire at least canadian content they're not spending a lot of money to acquire some content and so I, like i get it where they're going to spend money where they know they're going to knock it out of the park and their algorithms tell them it's going to be brilliant yeah but uh, I, they're kind of cheap in some respects <laughs> I, but I would say, like, when you look at their competition for the holiday movies against Hallmark, um, I'd say the budgets are pretty relative. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. You can see some of that, but then the level of quality, like the Chris Hemsworth action film, uh, what's it called? Extraction, I think. Yeah. That actually looks fantastic. I watched the Michael Bay one. I think it was eight, Six Underground or Eight Underground or something. Yep. It was it, it was super. You can tell it's super expensive, but it's not. It's not a good film. <laughs> it's so like, then you have The Irishman, which is a great film. Yeah, 
at the price point, I was blown away. <laughs> right? So like, that's okay. someone like, you know how Jeff Bezos uh, loves uh, Lord of the Rings and he basically, he was behind yeah. the purchase. Yeah. And it's the same thing, I think, with certain, uh, certain content of Netflix. Hey, yeah, we want Scorsese. We want that. We want that Oscar. We'll try, uh, we'll try and get our Oscar. Yeah. It's going to cost us $200 million, but we want that, you know. Yeah. Well, it's not cats. <laughs> so. Oh, my God. Oh my god! I yeah yeah, it's a similar relationship you have with Cats the film I have with Aladdin because everything in that film for me like I haven't way, seen it the way Mul- it? the way Mulan shot you know Mulan the trailer for the new live action that to me looks like a genuine it doesn't have to be made in China but it looks like it's uh, that from you know that part of the world but when I watched Aladdin everything was sets and everything was so evenly lit. It felt like I was watching a pantomime. I should have been watching a play, but I was actually watching a pantomime. That's how it felt. Oh. So I know it's a very specific thing, but even... even not no, even so, but that's the thing. So we used to make fun of a lot of the older, like 90s and 80s and 70s Canadian television. And you could always tell it was Canadian because it was pantomime, because it was lit everywhere. It's like someone was afraid of shadows. Yeah. 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 Like just you like know that's what, lit. Yeah. Yeah. Like where everyone looks bad and there's no <laughs> feeling. Yeah. Like you can you can create a vibe. You can create an energy with light. And when it's just like blown out, you totally miss an opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. Like look at this mood lighting. <laughs> <laughs> like I mean, some yeah. music videos. Like I've got those like light sticks and stuff. Like it feels really cool. You can do so yeah. much with light. But yeah, no, it's I, story's paramount, and I think that came across really well in your film. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. It was just, it was such a, it's got some genuine heart to it, and I really like that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for coming on board, and uh, we'll keep in touch. What we're going to do with the films, we've, we didn't just want to put them on online like some of the other online festivals and just have a, a, a block of them, and that's it. We're sending everyone that's participated, we're sending them out... Uh, a kind of a limited poster we're going to have an artist design so it's going to have your dog in it somewhere and you guys as well awesome. so we're going to work that out you know like um i actually emailed paul shipper now paul shipper designed the best posters the most cinematic posters worldwide now like ready player one all the star wars i met him once and he oh. signed a piece of artwork for vicky and i for the house it's it, it sounds like it's a really nice thing but it's moll around from temple of doom with a burning heart awesome so he, he, <laughs> So basically, that's our favorite um, uh, Indiana Jones film as well. So we're trying to get. Obviously, he might just say no. Might not. Might you know? He might have tons of work on. We're trying to get at least one artist to create the poster for us. So it might take a bit of time. We'll ship that out to you guys as well. I think it'll be good fun. You know. Cool. This is awesome. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Are you a big uh, Temple of Doom fan? Yeah. It's it's the darkness in that is oh absolutely like when you I, mentioned uh, Lazy Susan before in terms of sets all I thought was yeah. in the uh, Jones table yep absolutely <laughs> yeah it is the greatest well I really appreciate that and um, enjoy the rest of your day I've got yeah, you. it's uh, eight o'clock and I'm going to go and stick a film on for my little review thing thanks yeah all right cheers you guys I'll see you later Bye. take care see you now bye bye. <laughs>